We're going to turn over to Psalm number 150. This would be the last of the Psalms and basically the culmination of the Psalms. This morning we started in Psalm number one, celebrating the singular path to blessing, the preface to the book of Psalms, the introduction to the Psalter. And we have sung songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Psalms are those that come from the scriptures. Um, spiritual songs uh, seem to be those gospel songs that we sing in testimony before the Lord. Spiritual songs would involve much of what we just sung. We sung four verses that basically took us through the eternal existence of Jesus Christ, the life and ministry of Christ, the cross of Christ, and then brought us to the place where we will meet Christ in that fourth verse. I hope these things have ministered grace to your heart. You know, when the disciples went up with Jesus on the mountain, it was a glorious thing, but they had to come back down to earth. And when they came back down to earth, there were a number of challenges that faced them immediately. And when Jesus would get up early in the morning, go up and meet with his father, that was a glorious time for the Lord. And even as the sinless son of God, he tuned his heart to his father's will. But every day when he came back down off of that mountain, he had to deal with the reality uh, of the life that he lived. Uh, one of my instructors used to talk about working and ministering in the trenches. He said, gentlemen, we have a week here to do school, to learn, to grow, to, to rejoice in who God is and what he's done. But next week, you're going to be out uh, ministering in the trenches again. And I thought of uh, you folks, and I thought that's the very same for you. We come up, we come away, we come aside on the Lord's day. And we go up on the mountain to some degree, we tune our hearts toward the Lord and we think, boy, if I could just stay there, you know, with all for Jesus, all for Jesus. But actually, uh, we can't stay there, even though we can move through this week each morning, refreshing our souls, but realizing, folks, that uh, life is before us. Um, as one gentleman said, we live in the nasty now and now. <laughs> and uh, th that is a reality. That's not something to be said in any way to distract you this afternoon. It's just to say that we are all in the same challenges. We're in the challenges of the flesh, the challenges of the world, and the challenges of the devil. And that's why we need our souls tuned. That's why we need our souls turned uh, to the Lord. So I hope that our time in the book of Psalms is doing that for you and encouraging you today. And I trust that this final psalm will do the same. The psalms are divided into five books. Uh, one of these afternoons, we're probably going to take some time. Each of those five books ends with a doxology. That in itself is noteworthy. Uh, so if you were studying these things out, you would see that Psalm 1 through 41 is the first book. It ends with a doxology. And Psalm 42 to 72, 72 is a doxology. A Psalm 73 to 89, 89 is a doxology. Uh, 90 through 106, 106 is a doxology. And then 107 through 150, 150 is a doxology. Uh, we need to think in, in biblical terms, not to, to try to bring out $5 words, but basically we are to live doxological lives. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean, lives that bring praise to the Lord. Doxological, that means that doxa, it gives him the glory, a God-centered life, a God-focused life. So a doxology, five of these at the end of each of these five volumes is actually amounting up to the place where we're giving glory and honor to the Lord. He, he is praised, doxological, he is praised. And so uh, in coming to the 150th, you kind of come to the culmination of all the Psalms, doxology in Psalm 150, but you also come to the climax of the fifth book of the Psalms, which is doxological as well. And that in itself just settles our hearts and say, you know, above all things, we are to be living our lives to the glory of God. Our lives are to be doxological. So I hope that the simplicity of this psalm will do that for you. It tells us time and time again, praise him. And you almost, by the time you get to the done, done six, six verses and 12, 13 times, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Uh, nobody has to stand here and tell you what the psalm's about. Uh, the psalm's about praising him. Uh, we were kids, we'd sing hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And the other per side would go what? Praise ye the Lord, right? Okay, girls, you do this. Guys, you do this. Back and forth. What were we saying? Same thing. What is praise ye the Lord? It's hallelujah. 
So the whole song was that. You're, you're back and forth, just like Israel would do on some of the things that they would sing back and forth to each other. So uh, this afternoon, I want to think about Psalm 50 uh, as, as somewhat of a, a culmination of the Psalms, but it's also a culmination of the Hallelujah Psalms, the Praise You the Lord Psalms. Because if you were to take some time in 146, 147, 148, and 149, those are Hallelujah Psalms. All of those psalms are praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. So what we have is one final clear high note of praise, a final clear high note of praise. It's more than an artistic close to the Psalter. It is a description of the natural result of a devout life and in its unclouded sunniness, as well as its universality, it proclaims the, crea the certain end of the weary years for the individual and for the world. It's all going to end in doxology. Now, as soon as you read it, you say, they're pulling out all the stops. Where'd that come from? Those big old squeaky organs, you know? Uh, I, I, I just have never found a place in my heart for organs, and I'm sorry, because every time I've heard one, it was too loud to hear the voices, and I like to hear the voices. And sometimes the organist in the school I went to would pull out all the stops. And that was kind of cue to me to leave the building, leave the building. What does that mean? Well, you'd see them reach up, and they just, they're pulling out all the stops. What does that mean? That means all the air available is going to come through that organ. Well, listen to what happens here in Psalm 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Listen to verse 3. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Those were mouth organs, by the way, in that day. Praise him upon the loud cymbals and praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Don't you get a vivid picture of everybody picking up whatever they had, right? And praising the Lord. And that, I think, is exactly what the Psalms is, is seeking to do for us. They pull out all the stops, give everything to praise the Lord. The Lord. So this afternoon, praise that is worthy of our Lord. This is the third time I've made this statement today. I made it in Sunday in prayer time this morning. I shared it with you in the morning service. And this is the reality before us right there in the caption. Although our praise will never be adequate. I mean that in no demeaning way. I'm not saying we will not give everything we have to it, but it will never be reflective of how worthy our God is, although it will be in eternity, but it cannot be in this life. Although our praise will never be adequate, it can be both appropriate and acceptable to our all glorious God. That encourages my heart. And the psalmist here instructs us with appropriate and acceptable worship. Although our praise will never be adequate, it can be both appropriate and acceptable to our all glorious God. There's a ninefold praise him in this psalm that's led by praise ye the Lord, that is led by praise God, that is ended with verse six, praise ye the Lord. A 13 fold praise song in six short verses. It's simple and straightforward, and yet it's lofty and inspiring. I like simple and straightforward, but I also like lofty and inspiring when I'm talking about the truth from God's word. So where is Jehovah to be praised? First question, where is Jehovah to be praised? What is the answer to that? Verse number one says, in his sanctuary. What is the sanctuary? Well, if you're in Israel, sanctuary is where he dwells, right? God said, build this sanctuary and that's where I will dwell. You have that pillar of fire in the day or at night, cloud during the day, and God would dwell in that sanctuary with the New Testament. I mean, with the, with the coming of the, the temple and Solomon's day, the sanctuary was the place where he dwells, but it's also the place where he meets with his people. So a sanctuary is a place where God dwells and a place where God meets with his people. Praise him in the firmament of his power. 
And this is a picture of his almightiness. The sanctuary here could be heaven uh, and here. It could be as, as much as the heavenlies where the angels are, where we see them praising him in the book of Revelation. The firmament is the earth and the sky. So the vault of heaven, the vast earth on which we live. So where is Jehovah to be praised? The answer to that is wherever his creatures dwell, wherever his creatures dwell, enjoying his abiding presence and beholding his awesome power. The first verse, where is Jehovah to be praised? Wherever his creatures dwell, enjoying his abiding presence and beholding his awesome power. So wherever his creatures are, there should be hallelujahs. As we enjoy his abiding presence, as we behold his awesome power, there should be hallelujahs. There should be praise the Lord. All should praise him wherever his creatures dwell, enjoying his abiding presence and beholding his awesome power. Second question, why? <laughs> why is Jehovah to be praised? Verse number two, praise him for his mighty acts. And then secondly, praise him according to his excellent greatness. So simply stated what he has done and who he is, right? What he has done would be his mighty acts. His excellent greatness would be, as we learned this morning, that's who he is in himself. And if you're an Israelite, what is that about? Well, they're always reviewing the, the exodus from Egypt, aren't they? They're always reviewing God brought water from a rock and watered those, that multitude of people. Uh, the fact that God fed them, the fact that their, their garments, their, sh their shoes didn't wear out. So that was, those were mighty acts. It's opening up of the Red Sea, the opening up of the Jordan River. You watch through the history of Israel, and Israel will be looking back and looking at his mighty acts. But they would also be praising him for his excellent greatness, his glorious personhood. So just stop and think about this. Is this not what we could do tomorrow morning by ourselves with a Bible in our hands? Can we not just praise God for his mighty acts, what he's done, and his greatness, who he is? You just talk to him about that. You say, I don't, I don't understand the benefit of that. Uh, can you understand the liability of not that? How many things are crowding in your mind today, even as we have a Lord's Day to worship the Lord here together? You know, I grew up sitting where you're sitting. <laughs> Uh, I watch my watch my grandson. It's just a phenomenon to me that his Mimi and everybody else teaches her him to beat on the table during lunch. And then as soon as they put him in that chair, Seth grabs one hand and Kaya grabs the other and they start putting Cheerios in his mouth. <laughs> I remember the last time my mom pinched me in a Sunday service and she does, too. She talked about it last time she was here. I was 14 Still, still could not sit still in church. And I hollered out loud in the service. <laughs> My mom will be listening to this message. She was embarrassed. She never pinched me again. <laughs> so let that be a lesson to young people. There you go. There you have it from the pastor's mouth. I have sat where you sit. My mind is so easily distracted. I love getting around all these young people. They got all these ideas and all this energy stuff. They're doing stuff. They're thinking about, you know, they're going to change the world. They're going to do all this. You know, I love that because my mind goes there so very quickly. I'm fascinated with learning, fascinated with being able to do things. And I cannot sit still. So I understand as you sit here this afternoon, I understand as you find your place in the morning with the Bible, some of us are just going to have a terrible time sitting still and stopping long enough. To, to praise the Lord and say, God, you are a great God and you have done this and this is who you are. But I'm suggesting to you that with everything else pressing in on your brain and everything else calling you, come do this, come do this, come do this. I mean, a couple of you guys are building houses. That is a serious strain on life. That's serious strain on us spiritually. I have built houses. I know that. Because there's always something that you got to be thinking about. So why is it necessary that we stop and think and actually articulate praise to the Lord so we can keep our bearings where they need to be? 
so we can enjoy his presence while we're doing the other things. And so I plead with you, take time to do what this, this psalm tells us to do, and that is to re- praise him. Why? Well, for his mighty acts and according to his excellent greatness. So secondly, the answer would be for the display of his mighty works. There's a good Old Testament truth. Split the Red Sea, split the Jordan River, moved them across on dry land and the glories of his divine person. He is who he is in himself. And as many times as we fail him and as many times as Israel failed him, he still was Jehovah God. And he still took them into the promised land. And he still gave them barns full of food that they didn't grow. He still gave them houses they didn't build. Why? Because he's God. And he does what he promises to do. So when you and I can't imagine him giving us heaven eternally with him it's never an issue of well i hope i do good enough to get there it's an issue of if you will trust my son and have that sin dealt with that's got to be dealt with before you can spend eternity with me i will give you a place in the father's house jesus said And he wants to comfort their hearts. But I'm preparing a place for you. You wonder where I am. Where did he go? We need him today. Yesterday, we're going to ask Jesus all the questions. He's gone. I'm in heaven preparing a place for you. And he tells him those final hours, you won't need me to intercede for you because you can go great straight to the Father. When you watch that death, burial, and resurrection, understand something. I am going into the Holy of Holies for you, and you can go into the Holy of Holies yourself. And you can go with boldness. Enter into his presence with thanksgiving. Enter into his presence with praise. If you'll do it individually, if we'll do it as families, if we'll do it as a church, it'll stabilize us, folks. It's what we're made for. It's what we're saved for. We're here to bring him praise. So where, well, wherever his creatures dwell, enjoying his abiding presence and beholding his awesome power. Why? For the display of his mighty works and the glories of his divine person. Anyone here could have taken this text and answered these questions. We understand that no praise is adequate to the abundance of his greatness, yet he accepts such adoration as men can render to him. No praise is adequate to the abundance of his greatness, yet he accepts such adoration as men can render to him. Third question, how? How is Jehovah to be praised? I read those verses three, four, and five instruments, that ram's horn trumpet, Stringed instruments, a timbrel, which would be like a a tambourine, and dance, percussion, and celebration. Cymbals, loud and clashing, resounding. Use everything you have to praise him. David got in trouble with his wife. Took off his his kingly garment. It's a no-no for a king. He got so excited about the, the ark coming back, he's out dancing in the street. Now, this was not somebody on a platform with every eye gawking at him doing interpretive dance. This is what you see in a video where those Israelite people are worshiping God and they're all worshiping together. There was a very, very much an appropriateness to this. And he's like a kid and his wife said, oh, what, 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 what embarrassment you are. And he's basically, you know, I, I want to lead the way in, in humble worship to God. I hope you understand. That's all I'm doing. I just got beside myself excited about what God has done here. And I just was dancing down the street with the ark and the 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 gals with those rhythmic tambourines you know so this is this does not open the door for us to get crazy and worldly in our worship but it does say you know what everything they had what could they do what could a little kid do (laughs) they certainly can't stand still they could get excited about celebrating the lord keep those things in mind how is it to be praised uh, with everything right with everything we have in whole soul, W-H-O-L-E dash S-O-U, the best, L, that's the best way I know to say that. My whole soul, with everything we have in whole soul adoration. On these national sacred holy days, trumpet blast, joyous celebrations, music making, every kind of instrument, every voice. 
There's just a joy and celebration of all of these people coming together to worship the Lord. How is Jehovah to be praised with everything we have in whole soul adoration? That is simple enough, and yet it's challenging and convicting to me. It's, does he have that kind of place in my life? Is, is there evidence of this? Verse number six, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So lastly, who is Jehovah to be praised by, which is similar to where we started this morning, any and all that have breath, right? Any and all that have breath in a united course, in a united course of worship. Any and all that have breath in a united course of worship. Praise that's worthy of our Lord is praise that is anchored. Uh, in scriptures like the one we have in front of us. And I would just encourage you, there is nothing more satisfying for you than this. You say, well, I don't wake up with my soul where it needs to be. I, I don't either. I don't know that I ever have. Somebody could say, well, I do. And I, I'm grateful for you that you do. Not me. God's got to right my soul every single day. I'm exhausted some mornings from just wrestling through life during the night. And some of you are as well. I'm thinking I didn't do anything, but obviously I did. I'm just completely on edge. What are you going to do? You're going to take up the Bible and you're going to get before the Lord and you're going to praise him. And you're going to say, Lord, I need you to quiet my soul. And I'm not suggesting that I want the Lord to take any of that away. Because if that's what he uses to say, Mike, without me, you can do nothing. You are wholly dependent upon me then that's exactly what I want him to keep doing. Keep me dependent on you, Lord. But if I don't do anything about that, if you don't do anything about that to right your soul, you start pointing fingers at somebody else for where you are spiritually, oh, well, you're in trouble. The only person that's responsible for where you are spiritually is you. The only way to right your soul is to get your Bible and get before God and let him right your soul. You believe God can do that? Do you believe he wants to do that? Yeah. But if you want to be an Adam and Eve and go, uh-uh, <laughs> that woman, uh-uh, it's that serpent. You know what you're doing? What they were doing? They were blaming God because God made the woman and God made the serpent. And I think sometimes our anger and resentment and all the different things we deal with in our souls, at the very end, after everything's distilled down, you know who we're mad at? We're mad at God. So I need to take it up with God. Didn't give me a different mate. Didn't give me a different job. Didn't give me a different situation. So if I can distill that down and sit before God, the only one that can fix that and the one that truly needs to be fixed are having a meeting together, person to person, personality to personality. And he's going to go, okay, Mike, right there. And what blessed hope to say, you're right. Please forgive me. And let's get started a new day together. That's a whole lot more of a blessed hope than somebody telling me why I'm so complex and I need drugs the rest of my life to keep me straight. Mike, there it is. Confess it, forsake it, be cleansed, start afresh. You say, well, what if that takes multiple times every day? I suspect it will. And Jesus answered that question to Peter. You keep forgiving because I'm going to keep forgiving. <laughs> Many times, as you can imagine, every day, yeah, I'm going to keep forgiving you. The premise of him saying to Peter, you keep forgiving others, was that he keeps forgiving us. And he does. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. We want to praise you. We know that whatever we offer to you is not adequate in terms of that perfect praise that we will be equipped for and capable of in heaven. And Father, there's a need to write our souls, and there's a whole lot of complexity built into our personages. We understand that, but it's not because of you. It's because of us, and we know incrementally it seems like sometimes you just help us along further. You bring us further along in understanding. You give us hope when you teach us that if we'll confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive our sins. So, Father, help us as we've spent the day thinking about praise to you. 
the wonderful privilege it is, help us as we leave this place to begin a new week, even now as we're praying to make some decisions for you uh, that'll cause our life to look differently this week. We praise you and thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. 471.